Hi, this is um, Andy Rabaliati. I'm here as the session chair. Um, when um, Python was introduced to me, it was um, one of the things that was emphasized was it came with batteries included. So batteries included says there's the libraries and the tools to do what you want. And um, I'm uh, excited to introduce Trevor Bell here, who's adding more batteries to Python in the area of bioinformatics. Okay, Good thank stuff. you very much, thank Trevor. You. Thank you. Afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Um, nice to see uh, a good number of people with an interest in life sciences and bioinformatics. Um, the word viral is in the title, and I hope that those of you who have read the abstract and realize that this, these, are, these are biological viruses. Um, if not, now's your chance to escape, because it's a, it's a largely, uh, they're, they're components of biology in this talk. Um, as you can see there, I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at Wits University. I completed the PhD in that same research group. Um, we work on hep hepatitis viruses generally, particularly hepatitis B virus, and my, my research was based on hepatitis B virus with some bioinformatics thrown into it. And I've continued my work there as a postdoctoral research fellow, and I wanted to just sketch out what I'd done and how I'd used Python and the, the route that I had taken um, to, to, to leverage <coughs> Python and bioinformatics to help us with the work that we do. But um, first, two slides about hepatitis B virus, so that you are briefly in the picture on that. Um, it's unrelated to the other hepatic viruses. D is not included. D and B are, are, are uh, related in a way in the sense that D infection occurs with B, but not on its own. But A, C, and E are unrelated entirely. It's the smallest DNA virus infecting humans, 3.2 kilobases. The human genome is 3 billion bases, more or less. This is 3.2 kilobases. So orders of magnitude smaller. It's the smallest DNA virus. Um, those working on HIV, I think that's about 10 kilobases. Um, a very compact genome. Causes liver damage, liver cancer. Highly infectious, spread similar uh, route to HIV, bodily fluids. Vaccine is available. But currently we have 240 million people infected worldwide and about a million deaths worldwide annually from HBV-related um, infections and illness. And in this country, greater than 8% high prevalence on this map here, you can see most of Africa is a high prevalence. Um, in parts of this country, we have infection rates much higher than 8%. Um, and infection with HIV, the co-infection with HIV, is, um, is a growing public health concern. You can see in other areas of the world, uh, I wouldn't say it's a solved problem, but certainly um, it's, it's very well managed and good vaccines and good treatment options are available. So that's the scenario in which I work. I arrived um, to do a PhD in the group. Um, Everybody else in the group is pretty much a wet lab researcher. They conduct functional um, work in the labs. Um, but my project, um, I wanted to couple some bioinformatics with some wet lab work. And all, all that I've been doing since then is sort of um, is a continuation of the same work. Um, for those who aren't familiar, just two or three slides about bioinformatics to, to fill in the picture there. Um, there isn't really a, a, a strict definition. Computer science, statistics, maths, information theory, in the analysis and storage of biological data. So that's a very, it's a very broad definition, but it is a broad field. Um, study of DNA, protein, structural biology, drug design, comparative genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, metagenomics, there's all sorts of omics, and dash omics is a field in and of itself, or a subfield. Um, we deal with molecular sequencing data of host and pathogen genomes, that's DNA sequence data, RNA sequence data, the string of letters, ACGT. Uh, amino acid data, translated uh, uh, nucleotide data. We've got demographic and clinical records, laboratory test results, and treatment information. So a wide range, certainly in, in the area we do, a wide range of data types that we store. And that's just what, that's primarily what we focus on. The field obviously is much larger if you um, work in, in, in other areas, there'll be other data types as well. What I found was quite interesting when I looked into it uh, just in preparing for this, um, this EDSAC machine from the 1940s, there it is, um, 1024 17-bit locations of memory, and this is believed to be the first computer that was used to solve a biological problem, which was probably one of the first computers, I've forgotten the details of that history, but um, in this paper from Fisher in 1950, there's a table here of gene frequencies, I owe this tabulation to these Two researchers, said Fisher, the author, operating the EDSAC electronic computer. That is, that is, we think, from what I could find, is the first time that uh, that computer technology was used 
to, to be involved in a biological problem. So that's quite a long time ago, and only in the last decade or two has bioinformatics really come into its own as a field. Um, this remarkable researcher, Dr. Dayhoff, um, who you may, I think some of you may know the, the Dayhoff matrix scores, um, she certainly pushed the field. Um, those are her dates, but I think her work primarily started in the 50s and the 60s as well. And she was programming and using computers and programming languages to solve um, sequence alignment problems um, and other um, protein-related problems in the field. And she was using computer technology. So the field has been around for, for quite a while and quite nice to see in a, in a somewhat male-dominated field that one of the earliest people there was a woman who was doing that research. So I think that's, that's a good shout-out as well. The bioinformatics tools that are available are, are, are huge, a huge number, 3,000 plus just by doing a search. If, you're looking, if, you, if you go to Felsenstein's page and you look at the number of tools just for phylogenetic analyses, it runs into the hundreds. Um, a lot of these have been developed to scratch your own itch, which is typically how a lot of these tools come into being that a person will try to solve a particular problem. They're available on a wide range of platforms, many languages, ranging from command line tools um, GUI pop, GUI's pipeline servers, commercial, open source, and free, depending on your definitions. Um, so there's, the, there's a huge amount of, of resources out there. Um, and that, in a way, is, is part of the problem when you're trying to establish something, because you can spend almost as much time um, evaluating the solutions as, as writing your own. Um, why Python was the question I asked at WITS when I attended a training course there a number of years ago. I had some background in programming, but I trained further as a biologist. Um, it was um, there was good training provided by the National Bioinformatics Network a number of years ago. Um, WITS provided some training, but as we would all know, it's a low point of entry, scriptable, widely used, and as Andy mentioned, a good number of libraries available. So from that point of view, it certainly is being used widely, and WITS Bioinformatics makes obviously use of other languages, but a, a lot of Python. Um, and one of the other reasons um, during the NBN courses, um, I, I discovered that Postgres Python can be used as a procedural language in PostgreSQL directly in, which at one point was something I was looking at doing, and I, I did work with that a little bit. And that is certainly very useful, being able to embed native Python code straight into PostgreSQL as one of the procedural languages. That's a, that's a huge one. This was just to show you that bioinformatics and, and Python is filling up the space. Those are just six books that are, that are newer that I've, um, that I've shown you there. Um, certainly, there's a lot of interest in it at the moment with bioinformatics generally and with Python, which is, which is encouraging for all of us. Um, there's also BioPython, which some of you may be familiar with. Freely available tools for biological computation written in Python by international developers. Um, it's an active, mature project, part of the Open Bioinformatics Foundation. Um, it's huge in scope. I've just put there that last point. Provides methods for accessing a wide range of bioinformatics data formats, running analyses, and ex executing external tools. Um, there's, there's quite a lot of good um, documentation on it, but you do need to, obviously, with any of these frameworks or any of these libraries, you need to sit and, and spend quite a lot of time playing and learning to be able to get anything out of it. Um, right, so, so, where did, so where does my work fit into all of that? Um, I... Uh, um, yeah, that was, that was the approach that I took at the beginning. You may have seen that. I'll give you a second. Um, and that's, that's my philosophy. And unfortunately, um, you know, <laughs> it's been 20 minutes. Yeah, it's been how many years and you're still busy with your PhD. But yes, I'm doing a general solution. Um, I think there's merit in this solution. Um, but I think you also need it sometimes to realize that um, there's, you know, there's, there's a, there's a trade-off between how, how general you can make a solution and how much time you can spend on it. But ideally, this is the solution I think that we, we would all aim for. Um, this is a picture of the, the um, cohort site that I set up for my study. Um, and I'll sketch the background and then what, what I implemented after that. Um, establishment of a rural cohort, we enrolled participants for our study, we drew blood from them, and then we went into the lab and we, we did the wet lab side of it. Um, collection and generation of data, democratic, uh, uh, demographic, clinical data, sequence data. And in that process, I started developing the tools that I was going to use for the study. Um, Python has been exceptionally useful for that, as I've put here in the second point. Python scripts for general data processing and tasks, preparing raw data for import into a database, updates, FASTA, DNA and RNA 
or um, amino acid data is stored in a fast aid tech, which is basically a text file, um, responding to the needs in a working laboratory. That was, that was a core component of, of, of what I've used Python for, is that in a wet lab laboratory with wet lab scientists generating data, they will often need some kind of assistance which, with things that they would normally be doing manually. Um, and just by using simple Python scripts to be, to be um, manipulating a fast A file or um, generating a pipeline to, to help speed something, um, some repetitive task for a group of, of scientists who are primarily generating data rather than wanting to sp spend time um, with the nitty-gritty of preparing and analyzing that data. So working on my own projects, I also responded to the needs of, of, the, of the group, being the only person strictly speaking in that, in that group who could do programming, um, I kind of tried to dovetail the response to that and the development of the tools that I was doing to respond to those needs. And I find that quite exciting to be working in that environment where, where I have the skills or I know how to solve a problem that somebody else is busy with in a group. And um, I, I find that to be quite a, quite a key part of the, of, of the work. Um, what I did though, um, that means too much talking. Um, what I did though was to, to, to have two prongs, um, tools that I developed in a database using um, a PostgreSQL with PL Python for some of the, um, for some of the work in there, and then tools, um, which were effectively a web server with CGI, which I found to be, because at, at that stage I didn't have any experience with any of this kind of work, and I needed something that was going to be quite, quite quick and easy to implement, and that would give me a quick turnaround without having a huge learning curve, and I know there's lots of framework debates, and I'm not wanting to go down that route. I was just saying, for me, this was a quick and simple solution because it meant that I could quite easily maintain it myself. I didn't have a whole team, it was just me. Um, and if I get halfway through my PhD and some upgrade to some component is required and, and my whole framework breaks, I wasn't really prepared to, 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 to consider that. It, the, the PhD was a, was a, a, a rather uh, a sacrosanct entity that you didn't want to impinge upon. So I found a simple web server with CGI. It was cross-platform, so everybody in the group could use it. We had people on Apple Mac. We had some people on Windows. We had a group with no, no disrespect to them who weren't necessarily computer literate. They weren't going to compile their own code. They weren't going to download and install something necessarily. Restrictions on the computers in the lab mean that you can't always install software easily. So this for me was, was a win. It was a web, all the tools were web interface with a CGI, with a simple little CGI back, um, back end for non-technical users. And the database was PostgreSQL, which um, I think is great. Um, the Python library I then developed um, was, as I said, in response to the work that I was doing, I would see the way um, people in our group were working with data and I built up the Python library, which, which then became the core of all the tools um, as a backend for simple scripting that I would be doing. Um, for example, a, a routine process would be um, running a phylogenetic analysis um, on a set of samples or pulling out particular, particular positions, particular nucleotide positions within a DNA sequence. We know the virus well, all 3,200 bases, we, it's well characterized, and we know that at certain positions, certain mutations will be informative to us and other sites won't be. So a standard procedure would be to sequence a particular region of the genome, the BCP region, and we look at certain positions to, to, to infer some characteristics about the virus. That kind of process is, is quite repetitive, but it's, it's a defined process and it's easy to, it's easy to automate. So those are, the kind of, those are the kind of functions and methods that I put into the library that I built that would load a, fa load a, a FASTA file or open a chromatogram file if, you, if you're loading data straight from a chromatogram. Later on, we did some work with next generation sequencing. Uh, we used the 454 platform, which has since become defunct, and we've, we've also doing some work on the Illumina platform at the moment. So I'm writing some, some work um, some, uh, some code to help with that kind of analysis as well. So one of the tools would be simply that you would, you would provide a list of the nucleotide positions that you were interested in, and the tool would open the file and summarize those, those data for you. And that became, that went onto a web front end, and that tool is used routinely within our group, because that's, that's something that, that, we've, that, that, our, that our researchers have been doing manually. They've been looking, they've been looking at, at, the, at the data in, in a, in a DNA editing program, and they'd be and they'd be hunting through and looking for for positions manually or inter interactively, rather than than having it an automated process. Um, 
I don't know if this was a wise decision at the start, but all the development I did via SSH and Emacs because I had a server, I'd organized a server actually at home for, for quite a long time. I had a server at home, then I had a server um, on, the, on the campus. And because I was working on a, on a web server that I was interactively testing, I found that to be quite a good solution. Um, so it was Emacs in SSH and I would develop from wherever I am and you could test it through just you know, going to the web page. Um, it does, it does have its own challenges, which I suppose is a whole separate talk, um, apart, you know, compared to having a big fancy IDE on your machine where you can develop directly there. This was all done over SSH. Um, the database was housed on that same machine, so database files went across over SCP and were manipula manipulated and then imported. Um, it kind of became quite a hardcore way to do it, and once you sort of broken the back of getting that system working, you become quite hesitant to change to any other to any other system, and the web pages were hand-coded. I can write H simple HTML pages by hand. There was no, nothing fancy there. I kept it really simple because I had complete control and it worked, uh, and it worked effectively for me. It's probably not a huge, fast turnaround for any large project, but for the work that I did, it, it, it worked very well. Um, there were, of course, trade-offs between learning a framework or not, the learning curve, compatibility updates. Um, I did play with Django at one stage for a little while. Um, the difficulty with that is that it's probably a good idea to design your database and the Django integration at the same time because I'd done a whole lot of things with, I think, uh, custom types and then custom types didn't work nicely with Django at the time and then I just decided, well, I'll just not use Django. But I can see the benefits of using those frameworks. If you're familiar with them, go for it. Um, I had a lot else to do and I didn't really have the time. Um, but you do get, of course, benefits from, from doing that. Um, the Python scripts processed input data from a, from a web page and they simply wrote the HTML or any other data. Um, and then of course bindings for PostgreSQL for R. I used R for a lot of the, um, for a lot of the plotting. Um, if you submit data to the web page and it needs to produce um, a plot, I would just write out some R code or pass the, or pass the code into R. Um, the, the Python bindings are quite good and R's plotting capabilities are good. I know there's um, I know there's a ggplot2, et cetera, for Python, which is also great. Um, but I found using Python as the glue to hold a number of these components together was also quite, was also quite useful because, as Andy said, the batteries are included. You've, you've got bindings for all, of these, um, for all of these other applications, and it's actually quite easy to, to move data between them. I found that to be quite a good, quite a good solution. Um, this was just a simple, because I needed, I haven't got any Python code, so I needed something sort of Python related. Um, so there is, I would have a sequence object, just for those who aren't familiar with, with what I would have been talking about, I would have a sequence object which would have methods and variables attached to it, and this, this, this formed the core of the library that I developed. Um, it's the sequence object because um, for, this side of the, for this side of the project, all of the analysis tools were working on DNA sequence data or amino acid sequence data. So there was a sequence object with a whole lot of methods attached to it and I would, I would just expand that um, as and when I needed it. Um, having learned Python at about the same time as starting all this work, in retrospect, extending the existing sequence objects in BioPython may have been a better solution. David's nodding at me, yes. Um, yeah, do you want a retrofit? Um, so, so some, some concluding thoughts. Um, I'm running reasonably early. That's fine. Yeah, <coughs> am I good? Um, some, some, some concluding thoughts here, just um, uh, maybe to to expand upon what I've been saying and to trigger um, some ideas. If you guys are in a similar situation there, um, selecting the tools to use Django. As I said, there's there's so much available out there. The the open um, open I've forgotten the name of it now. The open biology project that I mentioned. The op before when I was talking about BioPython, there's BioRuby, there's BioSQL, um, there's a huge range um, of tools available. So it's, it can be quite tough to make those decisions and to decide what you're going to use, particularly in the biological context. If you're developing something on your own in response to needs, um, you need to kind of select what's going to work best for you. Um, the point about um, extending BioPython's sequence object, cost of starting over or reworking, at some point you reach a, a point maybe where you've made a commitment to something and you just are going to stick with it because it works for you. Um, that was the decision I made. Um, if we wound back the clock, you would do it differently. Um, uh, the lowest point of entry, the fastest return for results, again, um, it was a case of, of using Python, in this case with all respect to Python, really as a tool, as an appliance, um, the glue to hold things together. I wasn't, I wasn't using it um, how should I say it? It was, 
it, it was used as one of the components in a much bigger project. So uh, if I could get something working quickly and easily, and Python was great for that because, because of all the libraries that are included, because it's really easy just to, to, to quickly do something in Python, that maybe also runs the risk of you can quickly get something working and then you've committed to it and you don't really want to go back, but if you'd investigated it differently before, you may have done it differently. Um, working with non-programmers is an interesting um, challenge in its own way, and I don't mean that disrespectfully, um, but you, you, you're working with, with, um, with scientists whose, whose primary focus is, of course, not bioinformatics or computer technology. So looking at what their needs are and what their expectations are can be quite, um, can, th th there was quite a lot of discussion as to what was possible, what was feasible, what the best way of doing something would be. Normalizing data to put into a database um, is something maybe that, that wet lab scientists wouldn't appreciate the need for. So when they're generating data for you, you want, you want to import something that's been quite heavily, I prefer to import data that's been quite heavily normalized because it allows you all sorts of other um, uh, a powerful querying later on. But a wet lab scientist might not understand why you want to normalize your data. Why, why can't I just give it to you in a big fat Excel spreadsheet with lots of columns going across for every day that I repeated the experiment? And that, that's how they think, and that's how they work, and that's fine. But you need to be able to work with that so that you can respond to their needs um, to get the data in the format you want it. Um, there's certainly an increased bioinformatics awareness. Um, uh, there's a number of bioinformatics courses for, um, for honors and master's students that are being run at WITS at the moment. Um, and certainly within our group, having, having worked with, with me for the last number of years, I think there is an increased... Bio bioinformatics is now something that people add into their, into their research proposal. I will draw blood, I will do a PCR, I will do bioinformatics. Um, as though it's sort of one, one black box entity. We try to dissuade that idea of it being a black box entity. But, um, and I'm not saying this is unique to our field. Anybody involved in biological research, um, I think, is, is finding a greater and greater need and a greater and greater value in bioinformatics tools. Um, one person versus teams. I have a Git repository. I used Bazaar before, and I had a whole system, and I would be the only person putting anything into this repository because I'm the only person working on it. It works well for version control and backup purposes, of course, um, but I understand that there's a very different approach when you're working in a team or when you're working as an individual. Working as an individual, as I did, means that I get to decide how I'm going to do it, and if it's not the best solution, I wouldn't know, and I'd run along, and it would work well for me. But I appreciate that when you're working in teams, there's a different, um, a different dynamic. Um, this is something I wish I'd spent more time learning at the beginning. So if anybody goes to the GitHub repository and anybody looks at my code, I encourage you to remember the comments that I think it was David this morning about be excited more and critical less. Um, <laughs> be gentle if you have. I'm, a, I'm completely willing to engage in, in suggestions about how and um, and why I could do things better or differently or whatever. But be gentle if you go and look at the code. Um, I didn't come from a, a Python programming background. Um, so this idea of, of idiomatic Python is something I wish I'd spent more time looking at at the beginning. Um, I think those, those of you who are, who are um, highly proficient Python programmers will know the benefits of that. And um, it's something I'm actively looking at as well. Um, again, you need to look at your code and think, oh goodness, do I want to refactor all of this to make it much more um, idiomatic? In principle, yes, I do, because that's the way it should be done. Reality is that you don't really have time to necessarily go back and rework. Um, and we had a talk earlier about scale. Um, the scale of me working on my single project with my database, I understand, is completely different to um, a, a popular web tool that will have hundreds and hundreds of hits on it per day. Um, and, and the solutions will be different. So part of what I wanted to highlight here is that um, whilst there are complex powerful frameworks such as we've heard about before, and that's wonderful, it's, it's great that, that those exist. I also wanted to highlight that this can also work really well on a really small scale to serve the needs of a single small research group um, with one person developing, developing it, um, and, and it, and it can make a difference there. Um, what I've, uh, okay, yeah, uh, yes, um, I need to acknowledge funders, um, I've particularly my host and my supervisor, um, and other, other groups that have provided funding to me. And I'll put the last slide up and then I'll switch to the browser in a minute. Um, these are where the tools sit. I'll show you what they look like briefly. There is a GitHub repository there. Um, there's one contributor and that's me and that's fine. Um, but it's there and I'm happy. Um, everything I've produced 
part of being in an academic environment, it's all released, um, I think it's Creative Commons 3 or whatever it is, um, or GNU 3. Um, I've recently published a chapter for a book which is there just as an extra link for anyone who's um, in the field. Um, there's a bioinformatics chapter that I've published that's there, and there's a number of published papers that talk about, um, that talk about these tools. So I, I wanted to do a, a high-level overview for this presentation rather than too much of the nitty-gritty. Um, but just in the last, I think I've got a couple of minutes left. Um, as soon as I found the mask cursor. Um, I just wanted to drag this across here. Um, so this is, that, this is that page, Tools. And effectively, I mean, the, yeah, there's Python behind all of this code. But these are the tools that we've published. And they, they all have a similar approach in that you will have um, sometimes, a, uh, this is, this, I'm not saying this is anything new. We're all familiar with this. There'll be a, um, a somewhat complex input page lovingly hand-coded in HTML across an SSH connection. Um, and you will, you will press a submit button and a result page will, will be produced, which will contain whatever analysis was done. Um, some of the tools um, on this one here, one of the ones that's slightly different, um, that is, uh, uh, um, yeah, I don't know if the internet's going to go through the internet connection. It doesn't matter too much. There was another tool which, um, which doesn't produce a results page. It runs a pipeline, an automated pipeline of a phylogenetic analysis and emails the results through. Um, and that one's particularly popular in our group because um, the, the phylogenetic analysis um, of the region of the virus that, we've, that we're sequencing um, is a routine process. We want to do a phylogenetic analysis with a, typically a set of standard sequences to look at, to look at the, uh, the relatedness of our virus compared to um, sort of standard reference sequences. And that uses, uh, those of you who are familiar, it uses the Phylop, um, the Phylop set of tools, which are command line tools, and there's file name renaming that needs to be done, and the people in our group would just know to go to a, a command prompt and put in these instructions, and they would obviously have to repeat that manually every time they want to run that analysis. So, oh, here, it's finally come up um, without some of the graphics. I think the connection here, this one, the pipeline, um, the tree mail. So that, you, you give it an input file, and then it just goes and runs all of these tree mail. Yes. <laughs> um, it goes and runs the little analyses, and it bundles up the result, and it emails it to you. So you get it in your email. And that, that one is used quite a lot by, by our group, because that, that's a routine process. Um, the other ones have been um, developed for part of the work that I was doing, and in response to the needs of, of our research group. Um, this, this one, for example, this, this pad seek was done in response to preparing sequence data for submitting it to GenBank. Some of the sequences, the, um, that, that we produce are uh, around about 200, even less than 200 bases in length, but we may sequence two different parts of the same genome. The GenBank repository for DNA sequence data would prefer those two fragments to be together on the same backbone with N characters in between to place the regions appropriately. So the PADSeq will take two fragments and it'll, it'll place them. But again, it's designed, it's designed for with respect, non-technical users, it's a website, you go to it from whatever computer you're on, you upload your sequences, you press a button, you get a file to download that you then process, that you attach on your email, and so on. So, um, so that's, um, uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Um, the link, I'll just go back if I can get there, the link was there. Um, I think I'm, yeah, uh, I think I'm gonna leave it there. That's the end of the presentation, thank you all. Postgres. Mm. Um, tell us a little bit why you would use that and what do you use it for? Um, yeah, that, I, I, I didn't do a lot of work on that and it was a number of years ago so I'm, I'm, I'm casting my mind back now. Um, some, some, of the, some of the things I used it for were um, if, if I wanted to do some kind of processing or, or calculating of data to store within the tail. I know that you shouldn't, strictly speaking, include too much process data in a database because you can simply generate it yourself. Um, but some of those processes were, were a little bit more comp computationally intensive. So it was, it was a better idea, I thought, to simply be able to run some Python code within the database to do those calculations, populate the fields I want, and then that information can be instantly, those records could be instantly accessed rather than having to calculate on the fly every time. It was, it was those kind of solutions. Um, because, we, because it was 
uh, it was storing DNA sequence data um, and other clinical data. There were sometimes um, there were sometimes additional I don't want to say metadata, but calculated results that you'd want available. Um, and being familiar with Python meant that you could then leverage that that Python knowledge inside Postgres rather than having to learn. I think it's PL, the post, yeah, which is fine. There's, there's nothing wrong with PL, but being able to use Python and then being able to call tools or libraries like, like the one that I developed from within the database, I found to be quite, I haven't used it extensively. Um, it, was, it was a number of years ago, but at the time when I was populating the database and doing those, those calculations, I found it to be, to, be, um, to be a good solution. That's part of the reason of using Python and then choosing PostgreSQL rather than any one of the other good systems. Um, that was the primary reason for that. Python everywhere. <laughs> Wait for the microphone. Hi. Um, the, the, the map that you showed showing the prevalence of the disease. Yes. Oh, you wanted to go all the way back to that, yes. OK, an HBV question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it seems very unfair to Africa there. <laughs> is it uh, who, who who was doing this study? Do you? Yeah, <laughs> they, they, yeah, they, 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 there are some conspiracy theories um, about that. For example, though, you'll notice um, Egypt is in the intermediate for HBV, but HCV, hepatitis C virus, the highest prevalence worldwide, is in Egypt. Um, I think I think the answer to your question is a very long and complicated one to do with the history of Africa. And to do with um, and to do with the um, the availability of healthcare, the availability of vaccines, um, we find, for example, um, in in parts of the Western world, uh, that's probably a loaded term, uh, in parts of Europe and the Northern Hemisphere, and Australia, I think HBV is quite often transmitted vertically from mother to child, or through sexual contact in adulthood, generally speaking. In parts of Africa and in South Africa, we find that HBV is not pr transmitted primarily via that route. It's transmitted during childhood, from one child to another. And because the infection route is through um, the same as H HIV in the sense of sexual contact or through blood contact, children playing ritual scarification, there's, there's research being done that suggests that, that the the increased transmissibility in children of HPV in, in parts of Africa and South Africa is because of children playing and scratching themselves. Um, there, there have been, I don't know if it was HPV, there have been, I think it was HPV reports as well, I think it was during a war, I don't know where it was, soldiers were walking through um, thorny bushes and were scratching their legs and the soldiers who walked behind were being infected because H H HBV is very infectious. It's much more infectious than HIV. HBV sitting on a tabletop in a blood spot will be infectious for a long time. So even through just having your legs cut with a soldier walking in front of you, I can't, please don't quote me on that story. I remember something to do with that kind of transmissibility. So for children playing, cutting themselves, living, out, living in rural communities where sanitation might not be as good. Um, and, and I would say um, also, the, the extent of vaccination. I don't know too much about vaccination in Africa, but in South Africa, I think since 1996 or 1994, we've had what's termed the universal vaccine, which means that every newborn child in, Af in South Africa should be vaccinated. Um, and many are, but I think there are still holes in that. And of course, the virus can change, so you can become infected even after that. But I think, I think if, you, if you take this map and you transpose almost any other illness, on top of it, Africa carries a, a much increased disease burden. Look at HIV, look at TB, look at malaria. It's not unique to HPV, but certainly, and you can see here, there's a, there's a huge prevalence um, in Eastern Asia too. So that's, that's why there are people working on it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <coughs> oh, Andy, Andy, there was a question. Dr. Bell, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, just a question, is there uh, well, a comment uh, for, for us at, at it closer to home when someone that uh, an employee of us for 10 years within a week and a half passed away with hepatitis B. Uh, it was uh, World Hepatitis uh, Awareness Day at the time. End of July. But it was just too late for us. But anyway, it, wow. um, 
Is there collaboration in bioinformatics? How strong is that between universities and, and computer? Yeah, um, anybody else can jump in on that as well. Um, certainly, um, a, a UWC and, and UCT and UP, I think, are quite active in bioinformatics, and as is WITS, our node is, is um, certainly what, what I've termed there, WITS Bioinformatics, has now become the Sydney Brenner Institute for Molecular Biology, which is now WITS Bioinformatics, and that's a very active um, research group that is, um, that is, that is actively growing. Um, there, there, there are a number of um, uh, other institutes in the country. SANBI uh, does a lot of, SANBI is the South African National Bioinformatics Institute, Institute um, which, um, which is heavily involved as well. Um, I don't, uh, yeah, I don't know if, are you talking about formal collaborations between universities? Um, yeah, I think, I think it's like any collaboration, it's sort of an ad hoc arrangement for whoever's interesting. We, we certainly have collaborated with, um, with, with, with others here and abroad. Um, and I think anybody in the field is, is actively interested in, in collaboration, certainly. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Hi. Hello, David. Um, so now, knowing what you do now, yes. if you could go back in time <laughs> to young version of you, yeah. would you launch into the Python route and uh, stitch things together manually? Um, would, yeah, that's a etc. Would, would I do it differently? Would you do it differently? Yeah, that's that's actually a that's a that's a very good question. I, um, I would say, and it's I, I'm going to dodge maybe. Um, I would say what I did was right at the time because it answered the need. Um, when you when when you registered for a PhD, you're acutely aware of the time that it's going to take you and the amount of work you've got to do. Um, I'm not saying these were cutting corner solutions, but you tend to be sort of super optimized about what you're going to spend your time on. Um, I would say I would probably have spent more time exploring what was already available in the sense of maybe much more powerfully leveraging what's already in. I mean, I do use BioPython. I call some BioPython routines, but I could have spent, or it would have been useful maybe to at least explore what was available there quite a lot more, um, to maybe spend some more time looking at some frameworks that could maybe have made it Trying, but again, you've got to decide how much time you're going to a, spend looking at it and exploring it, and then saying, right, I've looked at 12 frameworks. This is the one I want. Now I need to get it to work. Um, yeah, I think I think I would do some things differently. Um, maybe I, I know there's there's a lot of nice lightweight frameworks that you can that are quite quick, um, quite. And I, this this work started maybe uh, 2008, 2007. So there have been quite a lot of changes since then. So I would say I would do some, I would probably spend a little bit more time exploring what's there, um, at least to be able to, to make, I, I'm not suggesting my decisions were uninformed, but to maybe make more informed decisions. Um, yeah, I don't know, do you have a comment? Would, what would you, would you agree with that approach? Because I mean, you've, you, you've done some work in bioinformatics as well, that's yeah, why I'm... Yeah. Um, so it, it's a well, virtually impossible question. Because yeah. I, I don't remember what the state of the field was back then. Yes. Like, um, I don't know where Galaxy was, for example. Mm. Um, Galaxy mm. is another system uh, where you can... Pi pipeline. Yeah. I think you can plug pieces into in. Into Verna. Um, yeah. You could maybe develop the, the tools that you have yes. and plug them into Galaxy. Yes. Um, something yes. else might be um, to try and collaborate with, with other people mm. more. Um, find, find computer scientists mm. that have an interest in biology and say, like, Hey, yeah. we can work together on this and get a publication out of it together, and yes. um, that kind of thing. I think, I think, and a, a lot more of that is good. Um, uh, we, uh, I think, Andy, you and I were chatting yesterday about, um, or maybe it was with Simon, about bioinformatics being a peculiar hybrid sometimes of people with biology skills and people with programming skills. And certainly at those NBN courses that were run, um, Dave and I were there, um, there were bridging courses to try and get the computer scientists to understand what, what a gene is and to get the biologists to understand what Python code is. Um, so there, there is always that difficulty. And I think, I think the, the, the collaboration is, is an important aspect because not everybody has an interest or an aptitude or ability or desire to be involved in both sides of those. Um, there's a, a small number of people who, who are interested in both, but um, a large number of people are interested in one or the other, and I think that collaboration is probably also a good way to go. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Okay, I think we've got room for one more question. Okay, well, Hi. following on the end of that, yeah. um, 
Uh, you mentioned, well, throughout that you were working on this alone. Um, so how are you planning on bringing other people in and are you? And if you do choose to do so, how are you planning on going about doing this or would go about doing yeah. this? Yeah, okay. Um, I've, I've continued as, as a researcher. So involvement through collaboration is a typical way where you'll just, as David was saying, you'll, you'll collaborate with someone who has an interest or has a project you want to work on. And I, th I think a lot of um, bioinformatics nodes do that quite a lot, where there'll be collaboration with different groups depending on the needs that other groups have and the needs that you have. Um, there'll certainly be collaboration would be one way. Um, and the other way is, is through actively, re actively or passively re um, recruiting students to join the group. Um, so that you, you would have an honours or a master's or a PhD student who would be working in the field, extending something I've done, building something else. Um, being in a wet lab, pure sort of wet lab research environment, we don't have a lot of a lot of people passing our door showing an interest to come and join a bioinformatics component. Um, but, but there is some interest, at least from one student at the moment, um, who is thinking of, um, of doing an upgrade, and there may be a bi bioinformatics component there. Because um, it, would, it would be quite exciting to have, a, f from my point of view, to be able to build on what I've got um, and, have a, um, and have a more active uh, a development environment to work in. Um, it's something, it's something that's, that, that, that we're all open to if there's interest from, from anybody. Yeah, good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks very much, Trevor. Thank you. It was a, thanks. Um, a great talk there, and I learned some stuff there. And um, thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks.